The following is a production of the Charleston County School District and the No Barriers Education Foundation. When I was a little boy and somebody told me that my dreams would become true, I would wonder, is it me they are talking about? Only a few people have realized their dreams of reaching the stars, but even fewer have sailed alone around the world. It is an unparalleled adventure, the longest race for any man or woman, 27,000 miles in a boat, alone. It requires strength of spirit. It is a test that demands everything a person has to give. It has cost some their lives. Neil Peterson is no stranger to adversity. He has faced and overcome hurdles most of us can't imagine. Here I was as a boy in a plaster cast. I could not run kick a ball. I could not be rough and tumble like other boys. As a boy, Neil couldn't walk. Neil was born with only one hip joint. I laid in my hospital bed. I couldn't move. And I felt very frustrated. I couldn't understand why did I have to have this pain? Why did I have to have this discomfort? Why could I not have that the life of that adventure, the life of that sportsman? It looked almost impossible. How could I possibly sail a boat around the world when I can't even right now feed myself, when I can't even right now change my view? He was never happy being in our hospitals. It was very difficult for Neil to walk. He used crutches at first. Neil's mother knows how far her son had come. His physical handicap was not his only challenge. Like other black South Africans, Neil's family was extremely poor. We live in a rundown neighborhood. The people fortunately own their own homes there. We lived on sort of the bare necessities, but we had lots of books in the home. I remember one day opening up a book, and the story was about a man who had sailed around the world by himself. I looked at the work of Joshua Slocum and I thought about the places he had seen, the people he had met, the storms he had overcome, the calms he had endured. And for me, that was a great adventure. And suddenly I started seeing myself. Could I be like Joshua Slocum? Could I actually sail a small boat around the globe? Could I survive those storms? Neil could read about adventure, but could he do it? Who would give him the chance? So Neil found it extremely difficult he asked several people whether he could crew on the boat and the answer every time was no, no. I remember going down onto the docks and asking people to take me sailing and people sort of saying no, so there's no room. I did not see the racial implications of being black, wanting to break into a sport which is predominantly a white man, a rich man's game. I remember the images of the police arriving at the schools with guns. And I saw a man running, and I saw the blood, and I felt sick because it could have been me. But Neil didn't give up. He finally found someone who would help him with his dream. I would move on to the next hull and knock and ask. And I'd look at the boat, and it wouldn't be a fancy, it'd be a miserable wreck of a boat, but hey, it had a mass and it sailed. And I would say, please, will you take me sailing? And I would get a yes. Somebody would actually say, yes, and give me that opportunity. Give me a chance to, give me a chance to actually experience what I've been trying to get, to be on the water and to taste that salt. What a great feeling that was. When I actually got out on the water, and I actually got to drive the boat, and I got to trim the sails, and I got to feel that sense of speed. I had to find a way to come out there any time that I wanted to come out there. And so I knew I had to go and design my own boat. I had to build my own boat. But my friends laughed at me. My friend says, you'll never make it. You'll never do it. But I went to the library to read the books. And I knew it was the knowledge gained from those books. I could do it. I had to go and find a, a career, a job, a way of being able to earn a living that would support me having that boat, would give me the chance to build what I was designing. And so I scrubbed hulls and I did what I had to do to save every penny that I could save.
He had the savings box in which everything went and then from the savings box I would put it on a savings card and he, he, he lived very, very frugally. When I launched my boat, there she floated next to these big multi-million dollar gin palaces and she looked so small and people looked at my boat and said, that thing will never cross an ocean, that heap of junk, he's never going to race that thing. I got so tired of hearing the criticism, I decided it's time to go, it's time to sail, it's time to live the dream. And so I sailed away. A month after I launched my boat, I put on provisions and I sailed away. But I didn't know how to navigate. So I did take a book with me and I took my mathematical tables, a sextant. And don't ask me where I was the first seven days. I was reading, trying to figure out where am I. And then eventually I got the hang of it. And I figured out it was real simple. And so I ended up navigating my way to Europe. Neil sets sail for England, alone, in a boat some mocked as a floating coffin. Then, disaster. Off the Azores, he hits a semi-submerged shipping container. With the help of the Irish Navy, he ends up in Ireland. It is here where Neil writes his autobiography, No Barriers, and launches his career as a motivational speaker. I had a huge challenge, but you know, I also had options. And I made it my responsibility that this boat will not sink. And so, simple solution, not big deal, just got this big pump, and every hour I'd go to the front of the boat. And I'd pump, and I'd pump, and I'd pump, and I'd pump. I'd pump for 20 minutes every hour, pump that water out. With the help of the Irish people, he successfully races in several international events leading up to the 1994-95 BOC Challenge a solo race around the globe that starts in Charleston, South Carolina. His little red boat must be lengthened to 40 feet to meet race rules. After detailed preparations, Neil sails towards the race's first stop, his native land of South Africa. When he arrives, he receives a hero's welcome. A few days later, he leaves Cape Town for Australia, when suddenly his boat turns upside down in a violent storm. The boat's mast is destroyed and his quest to circumnavigate the globe alone is dead. And then what really gets me going is the belief that I will sail again, I will race again, I will race this boat again, but uh, I will uh, eventually put together a bigger boat, a better campaign, properly funded, and not have to struggle as I struggle to get here. There's been years of struggling to get here. In 1995, Neil returns to the United States to begin preparing for his next series of races. In 1997, he creates the No Barriers Education Foundation to work with young children. Taking many school children sailing, Neil shows them the challenges he will once again face when racing around the world. Do you know which line of latitude divides the Earth between North and South? The equator. That's correct, the equator. And so right now what we're looking at is a chart of Bermuda Island. So if we were sailing from where we, we are and we're going to Bermuda Island, what direction do you think we're going to be sailing in? East. That's right. Bermuda is exactly 670 miles east of us. How do we know which way we're going? A compass. That's right. So we take our direction of a compass and we're up on deck, we'll actually look at what heading we are on sort of, and make sure that we're heading east and heading for Bermuda. Neil presents students with problem-solving lessons covering everything from navigation to living at sea. Let's prepare a, a bowl of soup and let's get it out of uh, the compartment where we keep the, the soup, one of the storage places. Yeah? This is where you keep the um, canned food. Okay, let's, let's go and cook some soup. Salt water. It's easy to get fresh water out of, out of under one of our jerry jugs uh, or out of one of the bottles of, of water. But why are we not using fresh water? 
because you have to carry it on board and it's a lot harder to get. Well guys, let's sample what Ellie and I prepared. Finally, on September 27, 1998, Neil is off again. He is one of 16 skippers who have signed up for the race's fifth edition. No Barriers is the first yacht to cross the starting line. Using satellite communication, Neil keeps in touch with school children and the media. Well, I was the first boat to cross the start line in Charleston. And uh, it was sort of uh, really a lot of, uh, lot of planning, a lot of preparation. Uh, being the first boat to, uh, to first pass scrutineering and have everything ready. And then of course sort of uh, being in the right place at the right time when the, ca the cannon fired. Uh, and uh, leading the fleet out of Charleston. So it's been a, it's been a, a, fun, a fun race and uh, technology has really made it a, a tremendous uh, way. I've not been lonely, I've really been in contact with the rest of the world. Uh, I haven't missed a day in the office so far. Ever. Early on, Neil deals with a few minor problems. It's been a fun afternoon. Sort of, uh, I hoisted the spinnaker a couple of hours ago, tried to uh, uh, put, the, uh, sort of put the kite uh, up on the, uh, the bowsprit. But uh, the pin that holds the, the bowsprit in place, sort of, uh, it's just a, a pad eye uh, into a fitting. Well, that's pulled out, and the bowsprit is going up into the sky. As a result, uh, I'm not able to use the, uh, the bowsprit at the moment, uh, which is painful because I can't really do with it uh, in the current uh, wind and wind uh, direction we, we have, especially with the light, uh, the light sail. So uh, tomorrow I have to try and figure out a solution uh, to, uh, to that problem. Sailing the smallest boat in the fleet, he is determined to finish the race and beat some of his rivals. So it's been quite, a, quite an eventful few days, but what has really done me more proud than anything else with this boat is right now I'm ahead of two 50-footers, two boats that have 10 foot more length overall than I have, who have got more waterline length than I have, but uh, I've been able to claw my way ahead, I've been able to strategically position myself to, uh, to, to actually catch them and overtake them and I've done that in a 38 footer that's been lengthened to 40 foot and so I feel very proud of, uh, of what I've achieved and what this boat has been able to deliver so far and uh, just hope we can keep it up and keep moving forward. Making his fourth equator crossing, Neil pays tribute to the sea gods. Yay ho Neptune, king of the ocean. You have allowed us into the, the continent of my birth, into the southern hemisphere now. So here I gather to give the offering I ask thee to look after me into the southern ocean, to return me back to this line so I honor thee again. Hey, he, Neptune, the king of the sea, accept the greatest gift that I can give thee, the bone for my meat. So ye, Neptune, take my gifts, take my offerings, and thank you, thank you for letting me cross your magic line. The rest of the leg is uneventful a tribute to his extensive pre-race planning. He arrives in Cape Town nearly two weeks earlier than the previous race. And we have seven schools in, in America, uh, in Charleston, and one of the schools asked me to present to the youth of South Africa a sweet grass basket as a, as a gesture of hope. And we are asking the uh, our school presenters to place an acorn in here, an acorn as a symbol, as a seed. If you have hope, and you, you water, and you feed, and you nurture that hope, it's going to grow into one big mighty oak. So, on behalf of the, the youth of Africa, I ask the two of you to please accept your gift from Kenhoi Elementary School and uh, the children of, uh, of Charleston. Yeah! On the race's second leg, the fleet leaves Cape Town and heads into the brutal Southern Ocean. Neil must overcome his fear of dismasting and test his inner reserve of courage. The brutal Southern Ocean. Neil must overcome his fear of dismasting and test his inner reserve of courage. But uh, I've also had a chance to reflect and to think about a lot of the things we are doing. And I've come to realize that it takes incredible courage to do what we do. But the real people of courage, I think, are our early ancestors. Those sort of uh, men who had gone to sea not knowing if the world was flat or if the world was round. Sort of, uh, not knowing they just fall off the edge when they got to the horizon. I think that is incredible courage. And the fact that they went to sea with no GPS systems and the very basics, sort of uh, a sextant and uh, mathematical tables to figure out exactly where they were. 
uh, no charts, going into uncharted waters and having to build charts. So if, uh, that is, uh, to me, uh, true, true courage. Christmas is a lonely time. Yet there is still time to celebrate after having survived cold temperatures and many storms. Because of the frigid temperatures, Neil develops trench foot, an extremely painful form of frostbite. It's, uh, it's healing now. I actually have feeling uh, in, my, in my foot where a few days ago I had no feeling. I can now touch, I can feel my, my fingers across, uh, playing across sort of uh, my, my, my foot. So uh, that's uh, sort of uh, a, uh, a bit of encouragement. Leaving the Southern Ocean and entering the Tasman Sea, Neil is becalmed for days. Well, I've had no sleep, sort of, uh, it's been pretty, uh, pretty tough on me. Uh, I'm feeling irritable, sort of grouchy. Uh, I'm just very frustrated by the complete uh, lack, of, lack of wind. And uh, the sails are just flopping all over the place, uh, not, uh, not doing anything. So uh, there's not a huge amount uh, that, I, that I can do. Uh, about these conditions, uh, just got to sit in the Grun Bay. Neil arrives in Auckland for a few days rest before sailing back into the Southern Ocean. This is the race's dangerous third leg, which takes the fleet around Cape Horn. We're coming along sort of uh, uh, slowly, we've cleared the coast finally. It was hard getting away from New Zealand. Uh, this is hard getting to New Zealand as it was getting away from New Zealand. But uh, we finally, we are moving away. After leaving port, Neil realizes he is not alone. He indeed has a stowaway from Charleston, a large cockroach. Neil's nearest rival is Minoru Sato, a salty 64-year-old sailor from Japan who is making his third solo circumnavigation. As you can see, uh, there's Minoru. We are up to our old games again. Sort of, uh, we're three days out of New Zealand, and uh, Minoru sort of uh, is in sight. Uh, he's caught up with me. He was behind. And it looks like it's going to be a neck and neck all the way down uh, the southern ocean to the Horn. Sort of, uh, though he does have a bigger boat and he probably will push further south. And if he does that, well then uh, he is going to sort of uh, get away from me. But uh, we shall see uh, what the outcome is when we get to Punta del Este. To realize this is the third time, the third time in this race that we, uh, we pass each other like this, over. Okay, Roger Benodo, I'll see you in a while. Talk to you later. I know Barry is standing by. For Neil, this voyage is a journey of discovery. Sort of, uh, this is an adventure. This is an adventure of a lifetime. Everybody should live their dream. Because sort of, uh, if you don't live your dream, who knows what you could achieve? Who knows what your life could be like? I'm living my dream. You got then go live your dream because life is too short not to live your dream. Oh, we are surfing down the southern ocean swells, sort of uh, quite, a, quite an experience. Uh, you can hear sort of uh, the bow wave uh, breaking, sort of fairly big sea uh, running. Uh, we're just running on the twin head sails and uh, uh, no rain sail up and uh, just making nice, uh, nice progress towards Cape Horn. Yeah, that's a, that's a Roger, that's a Roger, and especially with uh, the barometers uh, falling. Manoro, is your barometer falling as well, over? On March 11, 1999, 300 miles before Cape Horn, Neil's dream trip turns into a nightmare. A massive storm hits. Winds are as strong as a hurricane. The waves smother him as he rides out the storm in the cockpit. Tethered to the deck with a two-foot safety harness, he pulls down all his sails and tries to steer his boat through the churning swells. Repeatedly, his boat is knocked over. Unfortunately, this is the result of uh, all the knockdowns uh, we've taken sort of uh, here, sort of uh, all over the place, uh, lockers broken. So it's been, uh, it's been pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty tough. Two days after surviving the storm, Neil sights Cape Horn. At last, 
He experiences the awe others wrote about in the books he read as a child. He feels immense joy. After all, more people have traveled into outer space than have sailed past this place alone. Well, there she is. The horn and I. Sort of, uh, what, a, what a sight. And uh, it has been absolutely, absolutely great to be here. It's taken 17 years of dreaming. It's taken a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. It's taken the support of many, many people. My sponsors, my family, who are supporting Gwen. But we are here. I think of Harry Mitchell who gave his life for this site. And a few minutes ago I paid tribute to my friend Harry. You know, it's a very special place this, the bottom of the world, the edge of the world. And to, to get here takes courage, perseverance, determination, dedication. It takes a dream. The most powerful thing that a man that mankind can possibly know is to turn a dream to reality. Hard work, but it can be done. I'm 31 years of age and I've lived my dream now. Second hard work, but it was worth it. I've risked my life through 77 knots wind storms, but it was worth it. I hope every young person has an opportunity to live their dream as I've now lived mine. Look at this magic piece of land. When he arrives in Punta del Este, it's clear the race has taken its toll, both on him and others. Uh, this race, as I said before, is incredibly tough on the ones that we leave, we leave behind. And sometimes as uh, sailors, we don't realize how tough it is uh, on sort of, uh, our loved ones uh, left, uh, left ashore. But uh, nonetheless, sort of, uh, there's, always, uh, there's always hope. And uh, again, this race is about, about hope. It's not only just about uh, the victories, but it's also sort of about overcoming the tragedies uh, of, uh, of this event. So, trying to make the most of uh, the current conditions, uh, just trying to do a little, of, a little bit of reading just to sort of uh, relax before I turn the light out and, uh, and finally go to sleep. Though he sailed alone, he rarely felt lonely. He received plenty of mail from the school children, particularly his No Barriers schools. Let's, uh, let's see what, what we have. Ah, okay. Uh, no Barriers, class two, two to three. Hope, hope you sail to success uh, from, uh, so from Springfield Elementary. So uh, at one of our No Barriers schools. Oh, and look, look, here's, here's Spike. Sort of uh, Spike, the, uh, the Maroon Park mascot, which has been uh, traveling around, around the world. So uh, Spike will travel with me sort of uh, to uh, all, all corners. A day out of Uruguay, one last storm hits no barriers, ripping sails and leaving the boat damaged. Well, it's been a pretty bad uh, day. Sort of, uh, I've broken the antenna for the SSB radio. Sort of, uh, I have no way of uh, reaching the outside world. Uh, the, uh, my communications are knocked out. My computer is uh, not uh, responding. So, sort of, uh, things are, 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 not, uh, are not good uh, out here at, uh, at this point. No Barriers isn't the only vessel to suffer damage. Minuro Sato's boat, Shoot and Doji 2, takes a beating. Neil steers toward his friend's boat to take a closer look. Okay, uh, Roger. That sort of uh, uh, when you uh, when you come alongside, uh, you might want to come up to windward a little bit uh, so that you can heal the boat. So I can have a better view of it. Though they sail alone, they sail together in a sense. Together, they have battled the world's most dangerous oceans. In doing so, they have solidified the bonds of a very special friendship. Any second now, there we go, sort of on the equator, and she has crossed over to north. And we'll start counting up any second now. Crossing the equator one last time, Neil and no barriers make their way back toward Charleston. 
Neil discovers his stowaway cockroach, which he has named Cocky, has brought friends aboard. This is going to be the sacrifice uh, we are going to give to, uh, to Neptune. And we decided to film the sacrifice. So the, uh, the deal that I had with Cocky was uh, you can be a guest on the boat, but uh, no, uh, uh, no, no passengers. But uh, he failed to ignore the uh, request. So to Neptune, we are now sort of going to be giving Cocky's, uh, sort of some of Cocky's bandits uh, in, the, in the hopes that Neptune will give us some fish. Then more trouble. Realizing that much of his food supply is spoiled, Neil rations his remaining provisions and tries to catch fish. As he approaches the finish line, Neil has proven that with a little hard work, you can turn a dream into reality. He is the first black person to race alone around the world. Finishing the race was just such a great moment, hearing that gun go and know that I'd sailed 27,000 miles. I could not believe that I'd actually just achieved it. I just sailed around the world. At age 32, Neil realized his 18-year dream. He took 195 days collectively to circumnavigate the globe. Despite the limitations of his tiny boat, the one people called a floating coffin, he achieved what many only dream of. Congratulations to you. This is the impossible dream come true. He sought to teach them about conservation and the ocean, but Neil, you taught them and all of us so much more. You taught us about courage. You taught us about having a dream. You taught about doing something that people said was impossible, could never be done, and you've done it, and you have our everlasting congratulations. God bless you. Thank you. I was a child with a dream. I was a boy who tried the dream. I have now become a man who has succeeded at the dream, and you are part of my success. I want to say thank you very much. Neil Peterson has not stopped dreaming. He now spends his time motivating school children and corporations, urging listeners to live life to the fullest. As always, he will draw inspiration for his new adventures from books. Through knowledge gained from books, I got to be what I am today. Books have inspired me. I've returned to libraries to read, to discover, to continue dreaming. Knowledge does change all our lives. We must become lifelong learners. Let us learn together and let us help each other rise to greater heights. In life, there are no barriers. There are only solutions. Thank you.